It's the 21st of June 2010 and the Deputy Prime Minister Julia Gillard sends an email to the number one Kevin Rudd. For someone Rudd considered his loyal deputy, the email is scathing, criticising the Prime Minister for having a preferred primary vote of below 30% in marginal seats, with Gillard attributing this to his handling of asylum seekers. In the rough and tumble of politics, this would be just any other Monday, but for one reason. Gillard had BCC'd someone in who'd later be revealed as an American informant. For years, the Rudd-Gillard dispute was known as one between an egomaniac incapable of managing his staff and his ambitious and conniving deputy. But what if there was more to the story? What if someone else wanted Rudd gone? So we left last week with Rudd emphatically winning the 2007 election as the man of the hour who was ready to slay the dragon that was Howard. And personalities aside, there were probably three main reasons as to why people voted for Rudd. One, he had a vision for Australia's future, including immediate action on climate change. Two, he wanted to invest Howard's budget surplus into nation building projects. And then three, he promised to phase out Howard's deeply unpopular work choices laws. And so Rudd immediately set to work on this last one and began phasing out Howard's laws, which had taken power away from the workers and towards corporations. One huge caveat I will add though is that Rudd actually described himself as an economic conservative. Rudd hadn't actually risen through the unions and was part of this new wave of labor who instead came from an academic background. Remember this one, because that's gonna be really important. So Rudd abolished a whole bunch of Howard's reforms such as restoring unfair dismissal laws for companies with under 100 employees and removing Howard's Fair Play Commission to be replaced by the much more active Fair Work Australia. That being said, a lot of the unions were adamant that Rudd hadn't gone far enough as he kept a lot of restrictions around workers going on strike and kept the right of employers to lock out their employees. So though in recent memory, some have given Kevin the communist nudge and wink, much of the labor base actually viewed this as extremely soft and the rift between Kevin and the unions was starting to emerge. Now double up Kevin, we all know about your temper, but even if you can't keep your cool, at least you know how to keep work choosing. <laughs> keep King Kev's name out of your mouth. Uh oh. Now Rudd's other immediate policy action was to make an apology to Indigenous Australians on behalf of the federal government for the stolen generations. We looked at the assimilation policy back when we looked at Joseph Lyons, but effectively the government's attempts to anglicize Aboriginals saw them remove Indigenous children from their homes, which had a range of devastating effects. Paul Keating had commissioned the Bringing Them Home report, which outlined all the consequences of this policy. Chapter 10 lists too many to name right now. And the report recommended a government apology as a way of moving towards reconciliation. To much public backlash, Howard had declined to do so, but Rudd made this one of his government's first objectives with a 68% approval rating for doing so. Next up on the agenda was Rudd's nation building initiative in which he allocated $20 billion for infrastructure, 10 billion for education, and then another 10 billion for health. With Rudd again having a high approval rating for all these initiatives, he was riding sky high. However, the honeymoon was about to end. So throughout 2008, it was clear that there was a credit issue in America as many people were unable to repay the bank after being given loans that they definitely should never have been given. By the middle of the year, it was clear that the next few quarters ahead were not gonna be good ones. But there was much debate over just how bad this was actually going to be. For instance, Australia's Secretary of Treasury, Ken Henry, he definitely looked like this, no need to look him up, was hopeful that it would only be a minor recession like those in recent decades. Rudd's conclusion was different. For Rudd, this would be the worst economic disaster since the Great Depression in the 30s. As Henry himself said, Rudd's instincts were better than his. By September of 2008, Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest investment bank in America, filed for bankruptcy. The US Federal Reserve tried to negotiate a takeover from other banks, but that failed. Just like that, one of America's biggest banks collapsed, and with it, a huge source of credit and heaps of individual and corporate savings. This triggered a 4.5% drop on the Dow Jones in just one day, the biggest since 9-11. And with the global economy so intertwined, obviously this was gonna have a major effect on Australia. Exporting to the USA was now much harder and multinational corporations were laying off people in droves. It was going to be a grim Christmas for Australia. 
So with Rudd staring down the barrel of Australia's biggest crisis since the war, him and Treasurer Wayne Swan were adamant that they needed to do everything they could to keep consumer confidence as high as possible. If people stopped spending or pulled money out from the bank, the implications on the economy could be disastrous. Now, back in the Great Depression, President Hoover had tried to keep confidence high through a series of gentlemen's agreements with companies to have them not lay off anyone. He also routinely addressed the nation and encouraged them to spend. As far as Rudd was concerned, this was weak and was proven to be ineffective. If Australia was going to stay out of a bad recession, this encouragement needed to have more force. So Rudd and Swan made an extremely controversial decision. They agreed to guarantee all bank deposits, i.e. if your bank closed and you lost your savings, the government has you covered. Now, the Reserve Bank was adamant that this be capped, but Rudd and Swan ignored this advice and played a huge game of cat and mouse. Australia couldn't afford to bail everyone out, but it was lack of confidence that caused the banks to close down with bank runs. If people knew that their money was safe, they wouldn't then go and withdraw their money out of panic and the banks would be safe. The gamble was well calculated. Spider-Man, what are you doing here? Dude, you're a hero. You saved the nation from economic disaster. But why do you care? I don't know. I thought the Avengers could really branch out and expand into other areas. Go on. What if we had a set of Avengers for economic issues and we called them the Kevengers? I like it, but there's still more to the story. So Rudd and Swan's other signature GFC policy was the stimulus packages. The first one was a $10.4 billion one given at the end of 2008. A lot of this was $1,400 lump sums to pensioners and $1,000 given to low and middle income families for each child they had. With Christmas round the corner, Rudd put the government's money where his mouth was as he encouraged people to spend big for Christmas and stimulate the economy. The next stimulus package came in early 2009 in the form of a $42 billion package that involved infrastructure, solar panel rebates, tax cuts, and once again, one-off payments to most Australians. Remarkably, the results came in for the March 09 quarter, and against all odds, the Australian economy grew by 0.4%. Remember that everywhere else in the world was in a serious recession by this point. Let's not lose sight of what happened. Labor pulled off an absolute economic miracle. So it was quite a tough gig to be in opposition at this point, and the Liberals' leader, Malcolm Turnbull, really struggled. Though the results were incredible, Turnbull was critical of the nature of the stimulus packages, arguing that the only bit that Rudd got right was in giving tax cuts to businesses. He argued that the money needed to be given to corporations to retain workers rather than to individuals to spend at, say, Jim's mowing. But despite Turnbull really struggling, he was given a lifeline in 2009. So this guy right here, Godwin Gretsch, well, he worked in the Treasury Department and contacted Turnbull with a bombshell story. According to Gretsch, Rudd's $850 million Oscar program had been misused to give money to a mutual friend of his and Wayne Swans. His name was John Grant. This was doling out public money to his mates and was clear corruption. Turnbull took this dynamite to Parliament and accused Rudd and Swan of misusing their positions of power and lying to Parliament about it. He ultimately called for their resignation. However, there was one slight issue with this. Gretsch's evidence, an email of the allegation, was actually a forgery created by none other than Gretsch himself, and this was to curry favour with Turnbull. Gretsch admitted to the forgery and Turnbull's reputation was in tatters. It would only take one more issue to send Turnbull back to the benches. The emissions trading scheme. Okay, full disclosure, Mr. Mitchell. I have no idea what the emissions trading scheme is. I just nod my head whenever anyone talks about it and pretend that I know what it's about. Story of my life, Chris. Story of my life. So basically in the 2007 election, Rudd called climate change the great moral challenge of our generation and the emissions trading scheme was an attempt to limit carbon output by positively incentivizing businesses. So firstly, less than 1,000 businesses were bound to the scheme. Now back in 1997, Australia signed the Kyoto Protocol, which gave a carbon allocation to each country. Now a global trading scheme allows countries who need more than their allocation to buy carbon permits off of countries who have them in excess. Rudd sought to apply the same principle on a local level in that companies would be given a carbon allocation and if they were to go over that allocation, they could buy a permit of another company on the free market. This would have not only put a price on carbon, but had all sorts of other incentives too, like extra credits for reforestation and a delayed start of 2015 for agricultural industries. 
The ultimate energy target for this scheme was an output that was 5% lower than 2000's output by the year 2020, with the first year of the scheme actually going 9% over the amount of CO2 that was put out in the year 2000. Now, there were two main groups who vehemently opposed this scheme. One, the right wing of the Liberal Party, because this was putting limitations on carbon heavy businesses, but then also two, the Greens, because 5% was considered nowhere near an ambitious enough target and that Rudd was simply being too friendly to big business. Now, I mentioned the Greens because they were really important. The Libs held 37 out of 76 Senate seats and Labor only held 32 with the Greens holding five. If you've done your quick maths here, you'd realize that Labor needed either the Libs or the Greens to support the scheme. Turnbull had Ian McFarlane negotiate the package with Labor Senate leader Penny Wong in order for it to go ultimately through the Senate. Rudd was quite eager for it to get through quickly because he was about to head off to the Copenhagen Climate Conference. The end goal of this conference was to have China and India on board with stronger climate action, but Australia would come across as the biggest hypocrites if they had nothing to hang their hat on. One of the Libs' stalling tactics was to encourage waiting until after the conference when the recommendations for climate action were updated. Ultimately, this debate was all in vain. The coalition's right was certainly unhappy with Turnbull being somewhat positive about the scheme, and with his popularity in tatters after the Oscar scandal, Abbott edged out Turnbull for leadership of the party, winning 42 to 41. Immediately, Abbott formed an unlikely alliance with the Greens as both of them struck down the scheme in the Senate for totally opposing reasons. By 2010, Rudd had made no progress on getting it through and announced that he'd put the scheme on the back burner. This was seen as a huge policy failure of Rudd's and his popularity was starting to fall. I have much more to say on this and we are going to do a podcast on this soon, check it out if you haven't already, link in the description, but we are going to move the story on to where it really climaxes, the mining tax and America sniffing around. Now this guy, Mark Arbib, was a faction boss from New South Wales Labor who became a federal senator after Rudd's 07 election win. What a lot of people don't know was that he was the glue between America and Gillard. So as early as June 2008, the American ambassador to Australia, Robert McCallum Jr., identified Julia Gillard as the front runner to replace Rudd. But in October of 2009, tensions between Rudd and Gillard were starting to grow, and it was R. Bibb, who Rudd had put in his cabinet, who kept America in the loop. We actually know this from WikiLeaks cables, where R. Bibb asked for confidentiality in him being an informant. Amongst those leaked cables is one from the American Embassy where they speak very favorably about our bib, and there's even this voice memo from Obama. So we're talking about the guy over right. Yeah, top woke, top woke. He's the kind of guy to let you use his club penguin account even though he's a member. You're not. He'd probably even let you buy a puffball under his account name. And he's helping us get rid of Rudd, right? Now you might ask the question, why would America want to get rid of Rudd? I mean, right now at the time of recording, he's actually our ambassador to America. Well, Rudd had attempted to position Australia as the mediator between America and China as tensions between the two were growing, and he then refused to participate in the Quad, an alliance that would contain China with Japan, India, and America. Alternatively, Gillard had a reputation for being very pro-US. A 2008 embassy cable said that she'd gone out of her way to be helpful to the embassy since the election, and in 2009, she led a delegation to Israel to strengthen ties which, of course, America was very pleased with. Now, in 2010, Rudd wanted to take a mining tax to the upcoming election. In the Howard episode, we discussed how Howard's refusal to tax the mining boom was pretty much squandering it by allowing mining companies to keep the riches of Australia's natural resources. Now, Rudd and Swan heavily weighed up the political ramifications of going ahead and paving off the mining community and decided that they had enough political capital to survive the storm and win re-election in 2010. The resource super profits tax was a 40% mining tax which was applied to all mining industries, including gold, nickel, uranium, and even sand and quarrying. Rudd was going in hard on this one and wanted this battle, knowing that a huge reaction was coming. Like we said last time, technically Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton are Australian companies by origin, but they're actually majority US owned and so America was seeing a huge share of its profits be kept in Australia. Immediately, the mining lobby funneled $22 million into advertising, playing ads like this. Some people would have you believe that only miners are concerned about the new mining tax. I'm not a miner, but I am concerned. I should add that the mining industry was 86% foreign owned. On the back of the campaign, Labor was sliding in the polls, 
but still held a 52 to 48 majority on the preferred vote, numbers which Howard and Keating had both won with. As speculation began to grow on a leadership change, Gillard played it down every time. What the public didn't know was that a coup had already been engineered, and it wasn't by Gillard, it was by our bib. Amongst the conspirators were Tony Burke and then Bill Shorten who had been left out of the cabinet by Rudd. Remember how I said Rudd's non-union background would be costly? Well, so it proved in 2010. The Australian Workers' Union flipped their support from Rudd to Gillard and Gillard called a leadership challenge. No surprises, but Abib was the one who shot up the numbers for Gillard. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Take off the mask. Let me go to the election, Mark. <laughs> In fact, it was so clear that Gillard would win that Rudd pulled out of the leadership race, leaving Gillard to become the first female Prime Minister unopposed. But if the ballots had gone ahead, I want to know which side of the civil war you would have fallen on. Rudd's or Gillard's? But do you know that Australia nearly went into an actual civil war? Seriously, we were this close to the army versus the police. Click here to learn all about Jack Lang's wild years in office.